Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for the uh, the virtual high fives. I really appreciate that. So hi again. Uh, my name is Joyce. Uh, super excited to talk with um, all of you today. And let me know if you can't see the slides or you can't hear me. Um, and this is really a discussion, so please stop me at any time. All right, so let's just start with some of these big questions. So do you wonder how you can better coach your team? And thinking about coaching, do you have to be a leader to coach? Do you have to have that title? And how are you? How satisfied are you with the coaching and the feedback that you receive? So we're going to talk a lot about this today. And uh, there's going to be a lot of moments that for, for all of you to share your coaching backgrounds and, um, and things that have worked for you or things that happen. Uh, so really looking forward to that part. So just a quick introduction uh, of myself, and then I'll turn it over to all of you. Uh, so I, my name is Joyce Sloan. My pronouns are she and her. And currently, I work at TD Insurance as a principal designer slash senior manager. And my current inspirations um, are David Weidman and Charlie Harper, if you're not familiar with them. So David Weidman is the um, artist who drew the flowers in the top left. He's most famous for, uh, if you remember Mad Men, that's kind of the era 1960s. Unfortunately, he's not alive anymore, but his, um, his print screen his lithographs live on. Um, so I'm really kind of inspired by that kind of geometry and the colors. And my current second inspiration is Charlie Harper, who drew the birds um, in the bottom kind of middle. Uh, again, he sadly passed away, but he's, uh, he was an American artist who loved nature, mainly birds. Um, and he drew a lot of them. And his style was called uh, being realistic, but being really simple at the same time and getting to the heart of what each animal looked like. Uh, again, playing a lot with geometry, shapes, uh, bold colors. So he did a lot with birds, raccoon, you name it. Um, so these are kind of my inspirations right now from a design and art perspective. Um, you can see here, um, I also like traveling. Uh, the picture at the bottom left is from Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, so that's a really beautiful town, about 100,000 people in the Netherlands, super quaint. Um, in the bottom right is Boston in the winter. I know it's 30 degrees here in, in Toronto right now. Uh, that's part of Boston in the winter. And the top right is me trying to row a boat completely unsuccessfully because you can see I'm crashing into the cherry blossoms, but that was um, when I was in Japan. So I'd love to turn it over to all of you. Uh, maybe a quick round of intro, like are you designers, researchers? Just love to hear from all of you as well. Mm -hmm. Paul, maybe I'll kick it off with you. Sure. Yeah. Maybe we'll just go down the, the list of, you know, hopefully our, our participant list is all in the same order, but yeah. So, uh, right. Uh, so yeah, I do, I do love that David uh, Weinman uh, kind of picked there really some of the things I like. And follow up with you after that. Um, we just, our neighborhood, uh, we have uh, quite a few artists in our neighborhood and we just had our semi-annual neighborhood art show. So you know, different artists, they put up their work in their, in their front lawn or the garage or in their house or whatever. Just walk around the neighborhood and check stuff out. So um, we usually get something every year. And this year, there's a, uh, a, a an artist who works in glass. And so I'm going to probably get something that, that she's done. It's always hard to choose. There's you know, so many nice things. I can't uh, can't uh, buy it all. But uh, I've, I've given up, mostly given up buying sort of paintings because there's just nowhere on our walls to put them anymore. So. But uh, yeah, uh, so when, when I'm uh, not, not doing that, I uh, am a, sort of a senior uh, user UX researcher slash manager. And uh, uh, yeah, and I, so I spend a lot of my time doing coaching-like activities, of which there are many, many flavors of that. I've just, just recently as today, I was coaching somebody. But uh, yeah, so super really looking forward to this talk and sharing some stories about, about that. So next we have uh, Whitney, you're next on my list. I'm Whitney Quisenberry. Uh, I am currently running, uh, leading a team at the Center for Civic Design and we do a lot of coaching because we work in so many areas. I have people who are new to UX, people who are new to elections and, and everything in between. And I thought, what a great chance to brush up some skills. Super, great. And Alona, you're next. Hi, keep, I'm Alona. Keep it less than, less than five minutes though. So. I am one of the Torquay uh, 
co-organizers and uh, and a UX researcher for many, many years, and also educator. So I teach and I coach as well. So uh, coaching and teaching is really my passion. I love my work. I love the adventure and discovery of research and how and going in with some guesses and coming out with all this insights that you did, had no idea. And I love that. And um, and the teaching is really coaching because my my goal is to try to take um, techies. Uh, they're usually computer science students and then give them some awareness and sensitivity for users. And that's really fun and exciting and I think impactful. And that's how I try to, you know, scale my reach. And um, and I, yesterday I was coaching one of my former TAs who's a just a newly in industry and is uh, finishing the PhD. So yeah, lots to talk about in those in those contexts. So uh, yeah, love coaching, and I'm very interested in in sharing and hearing. That's practice. Thank you, uh, Harumi. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just trying to get my video to go. Um, I am part of uh, the Torquay Committee. Hello, hello. Hey. Uh, President, no <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm very interested in the topic. And Joyce, when you first started, you talked about does title matter? That grabbed my attention because I've been leading UX team for, you know, decades. Um, my last team was like, 80 people, but I was recently um, laid off. So now I don't have an official title. So I'm wondering how that might change the way I mentor folks. So really um, interested in your talk um, as well. I love your cherry blossoms in the background of <laughs> me being Japanese. I recently went to uh, Japan and I just missed the uh, cherry blossoms. So I'm going to get that vicariously through your picture. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right, uh, Stephen. Hi. Um, so I was a professor at York University teaching computer science and, and HCI as well. Uh, and in terms of experience with coaching in particular, and as it uh, pertains to, to this group, um, Paul was actually uh, you. That's right. Uh, in my uh, well, look how he turned episode. out. Yeah, and, and I am now a UX researcher at IBM. So I'm very thankful for, for that opportunity. And I'm looking to gain some uh, knowledge about coaching so I can um, pass on the, the, uh, the, the favor and, and the knowledge that I have. That's great, yeah. yeah good to see you. Tony. Thank you. Hi, um, Tony James. I have been at Bell and Bell Mobility and different parts of Bell for like... A little over 20 years, Alona and I have even worked, uh, done a project there together many years ago, which turned out really well and won one of the top awards at the company. So um, I have worked with various parts of the, of the company and the various UX design teams there. I have a very small team. It's just two of us right now. And, but I work across multiple uh, different design groups and uh, different product managers and uh, cross-functional teams of finance and legal, et cetera. So it's always great to learn tips and tricks for coaching because it's not just about your own direct team. It's about all the people you work with. So I'm really looking forward to the topic. Great. For, and last but not least, uh, Veronica. Uh, hi, my name is Veronica. Uh, I'm a senior service designer uh, for the Ontario provincial government. In this area, that's kind of like a little bit of a center of excellence for design. So for me, my experience with coaching and interest in this talk came about from the two kind of layers of coaching-esque stuff that we do. So first of all, um, I don't have direct reports, but I often do get assigned to mentor co-ops and they're sort of like my quasi, like, you know, supervisees on certain projects. So really thinking about how to, you know, advice on how to mentor them better and how to really coach them like I don't have a lot of confidence in that in myself and second of all um, to Tony's uh, point about sort of sometimes being a coach for like an outside area where people are learning about design and design processes um, that really really resonates with the way that I work so um, I'm really looking to uh, to see how I can apply some of these techniques there too. Great well thank you everyone so back to you Joyce. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that also helps me 
cater this talk to all the folks here and of course all the folks who might be watching afterwards. So um, if there is a particular area you'd like me to pause or talk more, let's have that discussion. We're a small group. Uh, if there is a part where you're like, I know this already, this is a piece of cake. So we'll, we can also speak through that. So I want to make this interactive and you know helpful for all of us here on this call. Awesome. So we will keep going. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about coaching and feedback, just some myth busting. I know a lot of people have these ideas in their heads about what coaching and feedback might be. So we'll talk a little bit about that and really kind of dive into the difference uh, between coaching and feedback and especially how that layers on with mentoring and sponsorship as well. So that's uh, where I would love this group to reconvene and talk about that. We'll have a little bit of a um, interactive session in the middle. And then the second half of the presentation is really about feedback and coaching within more structured settings, like design retros, design critiques, uh, things like that. And on top of that, I'm going to share um, how I used to layer on emotion to get feedback, and I found that relatively successful, so I'd love to share that. And then, of course, we're going to end with another discussion. You can give me feedback on the stuff that I've been doing. Love to hear from you all as well. So that's kind of the, um, the outline of the presentation today. So please stop me in any time if you've got any questions. I'm happy to, you know, we're a small group, happy to talk. So um, let's dive in. So let's do some myth busting first. So the first myth is I have to be a leader to coach. I have to have that title. Uh, my personal opinion is that no, you don't. And I've seen a lot of quote-unquote junior designers uh, who, who actually are really good at coaching. And I, and I believe that this coaching is a skill that everybody can learn. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about open-ended questions, the approach to it. But I really believe that um, you can be coached to be a good coach. And for me personally, like the title and the seniority have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. So the second myth is that uh, I can only coach or give feedback or design reviews on one-on-ones. Um, again, my perspective on that is that it can happen at any time. Like it can happen in an elevator. Like if someone asks you a question, you're like, oh, that might be a great coaching um, moment. So I think it's more about understanding when it might be a feedback moment versus a coaching moment and just being a like in tune with yourself and the person you're talking to. And that for me is really the, the differentiator between whether it's coaching or feedback and whether it's like in a formal setting or not. Uh, the last myth is uh, coaching feedback takes a lot of time. Uh, at least in design coaching, I, I mean, this is not like coaching a, you know, the Canadian soccer team to win the World Cup. I think that kind of coaching might take a very long time. But I think uh, depending on, you know, your relationship with your coachee and how you want to take it, it could be a one-off thing. It could be uh, a very long-term thing. Uh, so I think it really depends on the, the two people and how they want to go about their relationship. So uh, that's kind of the myth-busting part of this. Uh, and let's just get into some definitions. So I know this group here is quite familiar with this. So I'll just go over this quickly for all the folks who might be um, listening to this recording at a later time. So I'll just start with feedback and coaching and feedback on the left side. Really feedback is a looking back kind of communication. Something had happened in the past. For example, either uh, there was an action or a behavior that you might want to change or you might want to let that person know to change it. So it's really more retroactive, looking back in one way, like you are giving feedback to that particular person. And in terms of when it happens, it can happen at any time, uh, but feedback really is most effective when it is given close to the event. So for example, if, um, if say someone uh, on your team was writing an email and um, you thought that that email could have been phrased a little bit better or they could have um, taken a different perspective, it would probably be a better idea to share that feedback really relatively close to the writing of that email or at a during or right after they sent it um, as opposed to waiting like two or three weeks because that, that, uh, that waiting so long a time it's hard for the person receiving the feedback to remember exactly what happened. Um, so it's usually a better, better to get it closer to the time of the event. 
And then on the right is coaching. So that's really looking forward. And here we're talking about potential challenges. And really also the focus here is the growth and learning of the coachee. And I also believe the coach as well. Because um, my personal belief is that both people should really benefit from this relationship. And it's not really just um, one way. So it's more proactive, two-way. So it happens anytime. So you can think about, for example, if um, you are in a situation where a you a coach is asking you like, hey, um, I want to improve on my presentation skills or my stakeholder management skills. Like this is something that uh, it takes a longer time and for you and your coach to really dive into some of the, um, the questions and the motivations behind maybe why this person may not feel comfortable doing it and really making them plan. I did want to bring up this quote, which um, has resonated with me for a, a while now. And, and this um, this person, Michael Bongay Jr., he wrote uh, a book about coaching. And this was the quote that stuck with me. And he wrote, slow down on the advice giving, stay curious just a bit longer. And that for me, like really sums up coaching, a part of coaching, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but it's really trying to understand what are the motivations of your coachee, why they might be struggling, why they might need help. And it's really not so much sharing all your advice and your experience, you can, uh, really the focus is on the coach. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, this, I think this group knows a lot about this already, but for those who uh, might be a little bit more new to it, so coaching, really the idea is active listening. You're, you're really invested in the other person. You're really assuming positive intent and trying to understand the motivations, the behaviors, and potentially the fears of your coachee and why or why not they might feel blocked. Um, so we'll talk about open questions in just a little bit. Really, um, your job as a coach is to challenge assumptions, help paraphrase, repeat, summarize. And sometimes a lot of times by hearing that you repeated what your coach, said, it fosters this understanding between the two of you. It helps empathize or uh, the coach feels that you're empathizing with them, which is exactly what you're doing. And it just creates um, a level of trust from which you can build on and which you can learn more about their emotions and eventually like help them succeed and grow in the way that they want to. Now your coachee, your job as a coachee, of course, is also to reflect and of course assume positive intent of your coach and be accountable. Like, like the coachee is responsible and accountable for their own development, how they want to develop and whether they're taking those regular actions to, to reach that particular level. Some open-ended questions. Uh, I, there's many, many more, and I put some links here for everyone. A couple of good ones are like, what's on your mind? Tell me about what's going on with that stakeholder. Uh, what is or is not working with you? What resonates you? Uh, I like this fifth one. What might you do differently? I learned this from a director um, in my past, and I really personally like this because it doesn't presume guilt or shame. It's not like whether you did it right or wrong. It's like, what might you do it differently? Because oftentimes, whatever happened, happened for a reason, or it's probably the best decision at the time. But what might you do differently is uh, a way to open the conversation without all the emotional baggage. So I, I really like that question. And then, of course, like, what is the first step you can take? Uh, really getting the coach to think about what, what they like to do is really very much about that. So I, I, I will send this deck out afterwards and there are links here with more questions. All right, so I've done a lot of talking. Uh, so I'd like you all to interact a little bit with me and, and I know that this crowd probably knows all the answers, um, but just to make sure we're all like not sleeping on a Thursday evening, uh, so we're gonna play a little game. Uh, with coaching and feedback. So if, if you don't mind opening your chat, uh, you type in a C for coaching and an R and F for feedback. Uh, and I picked this because uh, I recently watched the Mario movie. I loved it. And I think this might be a fun example. So, okay, so here we go. 
Mario and Yoshi just jumped onto these blocks. They are being attacked by these Koopa paratroopers, which are these um, turtle-like things with wings, for anyone who are not familiar with the game. And Mario says, hey, Yoshi, great jump there. Feedback or coaching? See your app in your chat. Awesome. Everybody wrote app. Wonderful. That's feedback, because it's uh, thinking back on the action uh, and commenting on something that happened. Um, I see Alona has got your hand up. Go for it. Here she's the green thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yo, yeah, she's the green dinosaur. I apologize. I should I should really introduce these characters. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Yoshi's the green dinosaur. He hatches out of an egg. Uh, and if Mario sits on Yoshi, he gets special powers. Like Yoshi can eat a lot of apples and these turtle-like things. Yes. <laughs> and, and you're good with Mario, Alona. That was totally clear. Like, Mario is all good? Okay, just check in. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I need to check in with my bias, biases and uh, assumptions. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So he made a great jump there, Yoshi. All right. Let's keep going. All right. So Yoshi's like, thanks. I think I need to work more on my stomp. And Mario's like, why do you say that? So in your chat, please, a C for coaching, F for feedback. All right, we've got all C's across the board. Yes, and uh, this goes back to my point as well, that coaching can happen any time. I know this is a, a contrived example where a um, an Italian plumber is talking to his dinosaur about stomping on flying turtles. Uh, but hey, if you ever run into a situation like that and someone's feeling like they need to stomp a little harder, that might be a great coaching moment. All right, and lastly. Can I make one suggestion? Yes, go for it. If you're using chat for this purpose and it's such a short answer, we may be inspired by the answers of the others. You could try something called uh, chat storming where everybody types it in and they press return at the same time. Oh, okay. You can't see the other answers until everybody's pushed the return. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Is that coaching or feedback? <laughs> we should feedback, all answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I, I love that. Thank you so much, Elona. Uh, we're definitely going to try it for this one. So, all right. So, Yoshi continues the conversation while they accidentally hit the Koopa, which is that turtle like thing you might fall off, which is true, because if you don't stomp him accurately on the head, the, the, the flying turtle thing, uh, it will cause Mario to fall off. And if you notice the terrain right now, there's a gap, so he might die. Uh, so, all right. <laughs> and Mario says, I see what might you do differently. All right, so we're all going to just put in our letters right now and not press the enter. Um, has everybody done that? Yes. Okay. So hit enter and let's let's take a look. Coaching. Wonderful. Okay. Super. And the last example. All right. So Yoshi says, "I'm going to aim for the wings." And this is true. In the game, if you aim for the wings, it will cause the the, the turtle-like thing to drop. And there there are more stomps that are required, but that's the first uh, aim. So I'm going to aim for the wings with Yoshi. Sounds good. He's got. All right. Everybody put in their letters. Sounds good. One, two, three, hit enter. Oh, interesting. This is coaching. So um, Tony said feedback. Everybody else said coaching. Tony, tell me about that. I thought it was uh, sounds good. You got this as in, um, oh, sorry, I'm wrong. There's no right or wrong. I, this this one was a mixed bag, so I'd actually love to hear about this one. Oh no, I was I. Yeah, I hesitate. Coaching. I feel like it was coaching. Now yeah. that I look at it more carefully. Yeah, I hesitated too because it's framed like it's feedback, but it's feedback for a future. It feels for like a for future plan, for plan for a future action. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, all, feedback, it's all yeah. tangled up in some sort of French tenses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I put feedback as well because I, I just, I, I uh, you know, I, I focus on the part that seemed to be, you know, at, you know, after 
you know, basically sort of commenting on something, a decision that's been made or something that's been done. You, you haven't actually done it yet, but it's sort of signal the intent to do it. So, you know. it's like a it's like a transition from the coaching session to into the next action. So it's a really interesting transition thing because it's it's um, it's got a little bit of approval, but mostly it's passing control back to Yoshi. Super interesting. Uh, does anyone else have any feedback, comments about this one? Okay, very cool. So when I made the slide, I thought it was more feedback, but I think it's really interesting to hear all of you talk about that it's a transition between the coaching session, feedback, and thinking about it's feedback as it's a future action, but there's also the element of feedback because it's commenting on a decision that Yoshi did. Uh, so we will get there as well, that how a lot of times these are very intertwined. Uh, but thank you for this discussion. This is, this is awesome. And I uh, will talk a little bit more about this and we'll get, we'll open up the floor pretty soon for a more discussion. But I did want to talk a little bit about mentoring and coaching and also sponsorship. So, uh, so we talked a little bit about coaching already and the mentoring, oftentimes people ask, well, what's the difference between mentoring and coaching? So they're very similar, but mentor, my understanding, or at least how, how I've experienced as well, is that mentorship is more career oriented. There's a certain element that, or a certain goal you wanna hit in your career or a certain, uh, usually like a, a career step that you wanna hit and that's when you really would like your mentor for some very, very specific feedback on how to get there. Now, the ownership is definitely from the mentee, like the, the mentee sets the agenda, kind of works with the mentor to set a goal. So that's kind of my personal experience with it. And when I look at the definitions and thinking about what other people have talked about, that kind of aligns. Now, these um, do kind of blur into each other. So that's why I'd love to open the floor for it because you can imagine kind of, we, we talked about it just now that coaching and feedback and now mentoring can happen in a very fluid way. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. And I also want to plug in sponsor. So this was very interesting. I was recently at a um, another ed networking event for women in technology. And there was a lot of discussion about mentorship and sponsorship. So also the idea here is that a sponsor is someone who does give you feedback, coaching, but they do more than a mentor, whereas a mentor is like um, currently at your level and maybe the next level up, whereas a sponsor is someone who really uses coaching and feedback to really advocate for you within an organization to help you get you know, to a, a particular place you'd like to be. So um, I actually like to pause here and get some feedback and discussion going uh, about coaching, mentoring, and sponsorship. How have you all experienced this in um, your careers or you, in your way of working with coaches, mentors, and sponsors? Well, maybe a concern. Yeah, this is sort of aligns with, with uh, my my experience and understanding of these things. And I guess it's uh, I guess part of the big thing is sort of you know who, who's driving the relationship, and um, and also I don't know if it says here, but I guess in my experience, usually uh, a mentor is not in your uh, sort of management chain. So there's someone there's someone who's sort of uh, and, in an adjacent sort of part of the organization, and, but they have some uh, skill or whatever that uh, they can mentor you in, versus a coach. Coach is a little vaguer, but at least in my experience, it's sort of a, a kind of a sort of a management function, like like uh, puts the people in your team mostly. Uh, but as you know, so, I think coaching has more of a supervisory connotation to me. Like, as was mentioned, like. You could be coaching co-op students or people report to you or whatnot. But there's sort of a, it's, it's embedded, often embedded in sort of a larger kind of supervisory relationship. That's my, my experience. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, anyone else who's had experience with this and would like to share? 
Hi, it's Harumi. Um, I think, you know, when we were talking about the other question, when we were debating and discussing, was it coaching or feedback? I think it's, you know, some of this stuff is uh, situational. And um, I've had situations where I'm being a sponsor for someone who I'm mentoring. And just that, you know, um, the fact that I have very specific examples I can bring up, I can talk about how coachable this person was. I think that's really effective because you're not saying this person is just static, you know, they're smart, they're hardworking. When you can show how much they're willing to listen and change, I think that's very powerful when you're advocating for someone one yeah thank you so much for for sharing I think I know a lot of people who have mentors but not so many who have sponsors so that's really great to hear it from your perspective and maybe just to pick up on that the, the term of, of coachable uh, I think that'd be very interesting yeah uh, in this context in particular to address ourselves to people who are coachees uh, uh, this came to my attention a few years ago, and I went to my son's uh, tryout for a competitive sport. And so I went to the trials, and all these people look fantastic. So, so I went to the coach, like, how are you going to choose like the people on your team? He says, I'm looking for the most coachable people, is what he said, however he defined that. So he's really about uh, people who, that he could take. It doesn't matter how good they are, but can he make them better, right? So that's that's the people he was looking for, and that really it stuck with me. And, and I really... In my my supervisor experience, I I really found that people really vary in how coachable they are. Like some people can be very good, but like you can't tell them anything. And other people are don't, don't know anything, but they'll they'll just they're like sponges, and very soon like, they they know like quite a bit. So re really, sort of the coaching as an attribute really sort of uh, is something that I really became aware of recently. That or, or that uh, you know, and I would certainly that'd be advice I mentoring advice I give to younger people is. Uh, Try try to be coachable because you'll, you'll you'll get a lot out of it. Yeah, that actually. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. That actually segues really well into our discussion break uh, right now because I think you're right. We talk a lot about this more formal coach coachee, and a lot of the advice and the comments are about like for the coach right like open-ended questions active listening but there is that element of being a coachee to be coachable um the kind of idea of being open receptive to feedback and i think as as designers too it's really also not taking feedback personally and it's really more about your work and not you about the person uh, so i'd love to just keep going on this for a little bit are there other comments about this idea of what is it like to be coachable how do you coach someone to be coachable i would like to open the floor perhaps in order to help someone be coachable um, it might be an opportunity to switch the roles and say, and, and ask them, what was a situation in which you had to provide uh, coaching to someone else? And what about them made, allowed them to, to be more receptive to your, your um, uh, advice and just see if they are able to draw <clears throat> the, the link between how they give advice and how they might receive advice. Uh, sometimes having a switch in role or presenting it with a, a role reversal helps them empathize with the, the other person. Yeah, that's a, that's a great piece of feedback and a great tip. Thank you so much. All right. Um, are there other questions or comments at this point? We talked a lot about the definition of coaching and feedback that it can happen at any time doesn't matter if you have a title uh, or not any other thoughts about anything we've talked about so far i think one thing for me that was pretty interesting was how coaching is sort of more open-ended than some of these other relationships like 
where you're seeking mentorship and it's sort of like the mentee is like quote driving the relationship like they generally have some kind of goal in mind and they're coming to the mentor for kind of an action plan or in sponsorship it's sort of like you know seeing a, a high potential person who needs to get to that next step and sort of you know helping make that happen for them but with coaching where it's also like I feel like being coachable might also have something to do with just getting ready for almost like advice at any time kind of a thing like and I've noticed this about you or about something that you've done um, where sometimes I think like you know in some of these other relationships it's like people are more used to kind of doing like the the quasi analysis on themselves and coming to someone with a question or for support on something and so I think that's part of it as well like comfort with that open-ended kind of nature of it yeah thanks for sharing and I think what what resonated with me what about what you said was that the word coach doesn't have to be a noun like as a verb, it's very powerful that it can be used in a mentor relationship or a sponsor relationship, of course, a coaching relationship. Uh, but that, but the word coach as a verb is then more powerful because you can use it in many contexts and keeping that kind of open-endedness, that curiosity about the other person in all of the contexts. Yeah, just, so, yeah, just sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Uh, just on this coachable business again, yeah, I was just thinking of, of people that I can, I know that are, I consider coachable and thinking like, like what are their other attributes? Once a comment. So I think that like what I've noticed is they all seem to have a very high growth mindset. They're always learning stuff and they want to learn this and that and try new things. And so it's part of, maybe it's just part of a, a more general sort of, I want to improve and learn more stuff and get better and get advice from people. So, so maybe that's, maybe it's not like a specific coaching thing it's just uh, the more general sort of like mindset yeah absolutely there's a lot of discussion and talk now i think in the broader community and also beyond ux about having that growth mindset uh, i i also see it in like elementary schools where they're teaching kids now it's not about that i can't do it but it's i can't do it yet and the yet becomes really powerful that one day, some point, sometime, they will be able to do what they wanted to do. Well, super. Well, thank you so much for the discussion. We're going to have another round of this uh, in a little bit as well. So we're going to move on to the second half of this presentation and talk more specifically about feedback and coaching in more formal settings like design reviews, design retros, and also share a little bit more about um, how I was bringing emotion into this because at the end of the day, we're humans affected by emotions and that really drives our approach. So again, if you have questions or comments, please stop me. If you can't hear me, please let me know. All right, so let's talk about more formal design reviews. So I'm just gonna take a step back and, design, and define what the design review is. I think some people call it design critiques, but basically it's a situation where more than one designer or researcher, uh, I don't mean designer broadly, like the, the people in the UX field who come together and are giving feedback on each other's work. So that's the situation we're in right now. And I'm gonna start with this. Uh, I How many people have heard the make it pop comment? Like someone would come in and say, yeah, just make that pop. Um, but like it's, it's crowded. Um, I don't like the green. Um, yeah, I think one thing once I had someone tell me it was the wrong shade of green or it wasn't even the color, it was a shade of the color. <laughs> so, all right, so how do you deal with that? So let's just talk about you as a person giving that feedback first. Uh, I would maybe strongly encourage you to not say make it pop, but be more specific. So I will say as UX practitioners, regardless if you're a visual designer, a UX or a strategist, doesn't matter. There is specific terminology to your field. So as a product designer, I'm going to use my examples as like affordance on a button, design divergence, meaning like make a whole bunch of wireframes, sketch them out, make 10 for each topic, and then design convergence, pick the ones that give me the rationale for that. Uh, white space, alignment. So I think really the first step is to know your terminology for your field and your team's terminology. I know every organization has their lingo. So the idea here is to be specific. So in this example, instead of make it pop, you might want to say, hey, more white space, 
we can put more white spaces needed between these two lines of text or between this text and this image. So getting really specific with what you're giving feedback about. Then secondly, give a reason. So why, why put white space? You know, so in this case, um, this, uh, so imagine, this is one of my uh, past projects. Imagine you've got your shopping e-commerce and you've got a bunch of pictures and you've got um, words that describe what these pictures are. So for example, the feedback might be, oh, you need more white space uh, between the text and the image because that white space will help, help give focus to the image, which is what that particular user group is gonna look at. And then tie it back to goal. So every design should have a design goal, should have a business goal. So for example, in, in my example, uh, this is a real life example, we're, we're testing like shopping things by style. So looking at these images become really important. So it could be a dress, it could be a sofa. So then the idea or hypothesis that focusing on the images can help people, help customers assess whether that particular sofa fits in with their decor. So by doing that, it, it gives very specific feedback that the person receiving the feedback can take action on, um, as opposed to just make it pop, which is uh, can be interpreted in multitudes of ways. And I would say, if you're on the receiving end of this feedback, please, please, please ask. I think one of the things that we don't do often enough is to clarify the feedback, and we go off and think it'll be understood, but actually we didn't. So I would also encourage you to ask, well, similar to those open-ended questions that you saw a couple of slides earlier, you know, tell me more about that. Are you talking about the image? Are you talking about the text? Um, did I hear you correctly? Let me rephrase that. So you can ask. So I do encourage you all, all of you to ask for clarity in your feedback uh, if, you, if you do get very ambiguous feedback. And I want to share this framework. This is something I've tried on um, my teams in the past. And this is kind of a, a level up, assuming that you know you and your team know your terminology, that's a common set of lingo amongst you. And then I think the key thing here is that there is trust on your team. Like everybody understands that in a design retro, we are trying to do the best for our customers and the business. And it's not about the skill of the designer, but we're really critiquing the actual work. So given all those assumptions, this is a framework you can try and it's called consider, try, or do. So this often happens in like a, um, a Jamboard, like FigJam or Miro as stickies. And there are stickies that actually have these words on it, like consider, try, or do, or you can use these words when you give verbal feedback. So consider is very specific. It means think about my suggestion and then it's your decision whether you want to take my suggestion or not and you do not have to let me know what your end result is. So oftentimes this is like leaving comments in Figma or a mirror board um, or maybe it's even during your design review verbally. It's like, hey, um, you, you might want to think about looking at competitive analysis. Maybe Tesla is a good one. So it's it's a suggestion, but whether you actually go look at Tesla um, as a competitor, that's your call. You do not need to let me know whether you've actually done it. So the one in the middle is try. So this one is give my suggestion a try. It's still your decision whether you want to go forward with it, but I want to know the rationale. So this is a little bit more... Um, maybe serious, you can say. So uh, maybe for more critical decisions. So in this framework, try still empowers the person receiving the feedback to go and make that decision. You, you're probably in this case, are probably the coach or the manager or the team lead where you are accountable for the decision. So in, in this particular case, you would want to know why the decision was made. So this is more... Um, really more critical decisions, uh, maybe more if you've got like high level design concepts and you're really trying to nail down one and you don't have enough information, this might be where you might want to give a, a feedback with try so that everybody is aligned uh, on why that particular decision was made. The last one is do. So uh, I would first caveat this with, with the fact that this should not be used often because this uh, what do means is I expect you to implement my suggestion, 
and you would need to let me know when you've done it. So it's a very one-way top-down directive. Uh, sometimes this happens, but I would say if you've been using consider and try relatively frequently and regularly, and if you are having these sessions for feedback, like design reviews, if they are, they are regular, you probably don't need to use do very much. So this is like your last resort where something's really gotten off the rails. You need to course correct immediately. That's when you would pull out a do. So give these a try. They work verbally or um, in writing. At first, it's really weird to say. It's like, I would say, I'd like you to consider a blah, 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 or I'd like you to try blah, blah, blah. But once you've gotten the lingo down and everybody is on board with this lingo, uh, I found, at least in, in my past teams, this becomes very clear as to what the person giving the feedback is intending and what the person receiving the feedback should do about it. All right, so in keeping with the Mario theme, uh, let's level up and talk about emotions and how they affect feedback and how you gather feedback going forward. So uh, here, this is probably most well used in retros and team meetings, especially when, say, uh, something's gone off the rails or people are really upset. Now, I would say, again, definitely use, the, use this, uh, try this out if, that is the case with the strong emotions, but these also work when they're, um, well, with it, when the emotions are a bit more happy, it's just a way to gauge your team as well. So let's take a look. And again, this is what I've tried to love your feedback on all this as well. So I'll just start with uh, your general sprint retro is really about like what worked well, what didn't work well, what are we gonna try? So it's very dry, it's very technical, literally focusing on the work. Sometimes that's great, but sometimes you need to go deeper. So what does that mean? So emotions are a form of feedback. So these are examples that have happened in my past teams. Uh, I've had a team where on the, on the bottom here, it's like every retro, they start with everybody going to the internet and finding a GIF or a meme that expresses how they felt. And that becomes really important. That becomes the anchor of the rest of the conversation of like, you know, why didn't it work well? What can we do differently? And that feeds in with that kind of, um, what can we do better? part of the retro. Um, on the right uh, is a shout out board that another set of my teams um, have done and they love. So before every retro, everybody puts in stickies about shout outs for other people, their teammates, like kind of like kudos boards, pat on the back, um, so-and-so, thank you for helping me out, or so-and-so did such a great job in the presentation. It's just calling out everybody what they did really well that last sprint or that last month, and we pepper it with emojis. It's a huge celebration on the team, uh, and that also sets the tone for the retro because it's not always like, oh, that thing didn't work. I need to work on it. But it's also a celebration of even the little things that went well, and that is huge feedback. Um, I've had people tell me that this kind of stuff really helps them feel connected to the team. It's not just a big, um, hey, I launched something, but the little acknowledgements along the way that the manager cares, my team cares, that really helps them bond with the team. So I um, encourage you to consider it, try it, and see if it works for your team. And this is another example that I've seen on one of my teams as well. Uh, so these vehicles mean something very specific, but they do tie back to emotions and effort. So for example, and, and I'll go back, before COVID, these were real cars that people would give out during retro and it would sit on their desk for the sprint. It's like a, like a source of pride for these folks. So a smart car went to the person that sprint who had a great idea and that's voted on by the, um, all the members in the scrum team. I mean, you would just applaud and it's very informal, but you would literally get a smart car uh, if you came up with a brilliant idea or just a smart idea, better way of doing things. The, uh, I'm losing my words. <laughs> the, 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 what is this thing called? It's the, the, the car that the post person. The, Mail truck. <laughs> thank Mail you. Truck. <laughs> post truck, apologies. Uh, so, this is a, what they call kind of the steady bus. Um, 
it was just the idea that they just picked a scar. But the idea, it was someone was just steady, was a rock on the team. This person could have been uh, mentoring, coaching, helping others, but just a solid rock um, for the team. And this person would get the bus in the middle. Uh, the school bus, I know it's a bit abstract. They have special names. Uh, the school bus, they called it a struggle bus. I mean, you can use different artifacts, but the school bus for them was a struggle bus where someone really struggled with something. It could be a stakeholder. It could be lines of code, um, banging your head against Sigma, whatever it may be, and that's it. Like you don't have to solve it, but it was just acknowledging that that person went through a struggle. They gave their best effort. They may not have figured it out yet, but we acknowledge the effort. So that was the school bus. And the bottom is the fire truck. Uh, there are always fires, so this went to the person who dealt with the fire, either graciously or ungraciously, but acknowledging their efforts to put out what it was. Uh, so this worked really well. Again, as I said, that these people had these artifacts, these cars on their desks and people walking by saw it and comment on them. And again, it's a, a little bit of acknowledgement for, for their efforts. All right, and leveling up even more. So now we're getting into the state of actual emotion. So uh, this framework is not mine. It's actually taught in kindergarten. Uh, in many areas around the world. It's called zones of regulation. And the idea is to help children identify their emotions and what they might want to do about them. The caveat here is there is no quote unquote bad emotion. All emotions are acceptable. It's how you deal with them. And the goal is always to go back to green, which is your calm emotion. So green is your calm, happy, positive, focused. Blue is kind of, ah, oh, you're sleepy, you're really tired. Again, there's no, no no guilt, no shame, nothing wrong about it. Your goal is to acknowledge it and go back to green. Yellow is your uh, kind of anxious. It could also be you're really excited. It's just kind of it indicates that you're slightly out of control, but still okay. And red is just you've lost it. Like, that's it. At the end of the day, um, this is where, like, shoes get thrown. Um, I mean, for kindergartners, I can imagine shoes being thrown. Uh, if you're an adult, you just might be super furious, um, need to go for a walk, need to vent. What, it's different for every person. And the idea is to just acknowledge what zone, what color you are in, and find a way to get back to green. So um, I use this framework in my retros as well. And this, um, in this particular instance, this was like a, I think, end of quarter kind of look back. There were certain themes that the organizations working on like career development or that kind of return to the office, what people thought. And I asked everybody to write it in this framework. I feel blah, 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 because blah, 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 and pick a sticky, either in red, yellow, green, or blue. In this case, you don't see the red, but in other boards, there were red. And again, it, sh it just shows that like, it doesn't have to be a manager running this. It could be your scrum master. Uh, I know, for example, in my past, I've had team members rotate being like retro owners and running retro. So it could be that person, but it just kind of goes to show that the team cares. The team acknowledged that I feel blue or I'm feeling great today um, because blah, blah, blah. And in that way, then of course you can use affinity mapping and see if there are themes, but you just visually get a sense. Like if you see a lot of red, you're like, ah, okay. Like maybe I, you might want to lean in more and really try to empathize um, and understand, ask those open-ended questions to see what's going So it really kind of helps you focus your feedback. And the other way to do it, um, either in the emotion colors or just simply fun or overwhelmed, um, and this, in this case, this team is very heavy on graphs, so they just literally track their emotions over time. And it's really interesting um, because then you can go back in time, like as a team, like how people are doing, and maybe pinpoint like are there at certain times, maybe before a release when people are more anxious and maybe that's when you might wanna lean in as a leader um, or as a coworker to think and help your team out. So um, this kind of wraps up the part of the presentation. Um, this is more about sharing like, I think the key takeaway here is that don't forget about your emotions in your feedback and your coaching because a lot of times at least in my experience, the emotions really drive whether someone wants to take that next step or whether they're afraid of something and it's hindering them from that next step. 
and from a team structure and, and team retros, design retros, design critiques, um, getting a pulse on the emotions of the people um, will be important. All right, so uh, we're having out this conversation. So going back to our earlier comments, uh, earlier questions about being a better coach, do you have to be a leader and how satisfied are you with the coaching feedback? Um, I hope some of the conversations and discussions today can help you in your day-to-day. -day. Um, and also love to hear from you all as well. Um, this is a quick summary that, you know, of course, feedback is the looking back retroactive in one way and coaching is forward. And we talked a lot today about coaching as a verb, which can be used in mentoring sessions, sponsorship sessions, and also about um, what being coachable looks like. And then finally, when you're giving feedback, think about being specific. Think about being specific in both you being the person giving the feedback as well as the person receiving the feedback and thinking about the emotions um, along the way. And I'll leave this quote here again, because I think it's super important for all of us to slow down a little bit, be a little bit more curious uh, about the other person and about each other. All right, uh, that takes me to the end of the presentation.